Hi everyone, my name is Taylor McLean and I'm the creative lead at the Center for Communicating Knowledge here at Ryerson. We call it CCK for short. Welcome to Research in Action, Effective Strategies for Knowledge Mobilization. We're trying something a little bit different with this talk. Instead of presenting it live through Zoom, we thought we'd pre-record it and make it available to you via YouTube but we'll also be hosting a live Q&A event on February 4th at 1 p.m. We thought this approach would allow everyone to absorb the talk on their own time, but still have the opportunity to ask questions and engage in discussion around knowledge mobilization. If you'd like to provide some questions in advance of the Q&A session, we would love that. You can uh, ask them in the comments below and I will make sure to answer them during the session. Okay, let's get started. The plan for most knowledge mobilization projects, if I'm being honest, begins about one to two days before the grant proposal deadline. Usually the team has completed most of the application and all that's left is that pesky little knowledge mobilization plan. Now I call this the menu approach to knowledge mobilization because it's usually at this point that someone from the research team emails me to see a menu of CCK services and prices. Once they have that menu, they simply slot the assets into their knowledge mobilization plan. There's always a journal article, maybe they add in a policy brief, and more often than not, they include a research website. Now, I don't blame researchers and academics for approaching their knowledge mobilization planning this way. Research communication is still an emerging field, which means that the work can be confusing and frustrating and downright anxiety inducing. And this is because the possibilities and the parameters haven't been clearly defined. As a result, KMB is often an afterthought. It's an end of stage effort to satisfy granting agencies. So if you approach knowledge mobilization using a broad strokes plan that you put together at the last minute, you are not alone. But I think that we can do better, and I think it's never been more important that we do better. What do I mean by doing better? I mean engaging more meaningfully with the people that need our research. Fake news, conspiracy theories, threats to democracy. As members of the academy, we need to do a better job of not just making research accessible, but breaking down the barriers that prevent people from engaging with it, accepting it, and using it. So let's start at the very beginning with terminology. Depending on your discipline, different words may be used to describe research communication. Knowledge translation, knowledge transfer, research dissemination... Unfortunately, these terms are used interchangeably and there's a real lack of consistency. Now at CCK, our preferred term is knowledge mobilization. And just a quick note, because academic institutions love their acronyms, we often call knowledge mobilization KMB for short. So you'll hear me use that throughout this presentation. So we use the term knowledge mobilization at CCK because it suggests a more active approach for ensuring research uptake. So it's not just about making information accessible, but it's also about encouraging communities of practice to use that information in a meaningful way. This is how we define knowledge mobilization, and this is what informs our approach to the work. Now, the issue of inconsistent terminology isn't just about words, it also points to a greater issue within the academy with defining the actual process of knowledge mobilization itself. In her MRP, titled Exploring the Field and Practice of Knowledge Mobilization, Monica Batak explains that there is a fractured and divisive understanding of what it means to use, act upon, or uptake research. While we know much about research production and research use, we know very little about the mediation, the middle space, the intermediary processes between the two. When I read this quote, I found it so reassuring because it explained why I found it so difficult to find formalized frameworks 
or best practices for engaging in knowledge mobilization work. So that's my goal with today's presentation, to demystify the KMB process by walking you through a planning framework that I hope will help you engage in a deeper and more meaningful ideation around KMB projects and initiatives. And I'm gonna encourage you to ditch the menu approach so that you can explore new opportunities and develop more effective KMB projects. Before we go any further, I should probably give you a bit more information about me and also about the Center for Communicating Knowledge. I completed my master's degree here in the professional communication program, and I'm also a graphic designer. Um, as a graphic designer, I've worked primarily with researchers and public institutions, helping them to communicate complex and highly technical information in ways that are entertaining, that don't bore people. That's exactly what my goal is with every project that I work on at CCK. Educate people, yes, but also entertain them. So what exactly does CCK do? Well, we are a knowledge mobilization unit. And we work with researchers and academics across the university to help them find creative and innovative ways of communicating their research. We operate a lot like a creative agency, and the researchers and academics are our clients. We are a small team. Um, we work primarily with students who have skills in writing, design, videographer, web development, and also people who are highly curious and very good at clarifying and distilling down really complicated information and ideas. So in terms of the services that we offer, we do web design, video production, podcast production, you name it. If you're interested in our services, you can find more information about us on our website. And the images on the screen here are just some samples of some of the work that we've done recently. So I wanted to provide this background just to give you some context about the frameworks and the lenses that I bring to this work. I approach it as a designer and a communications strategist. And in the world of knowledge mobilization, I really don't see design and communication skills being talked about much. We'll get into that a little bit uh, further in the presentation, but I wanted to highlight that that's how I tend to approach and frame knowledge mobilization is through this design and communications lens. Because any KMB project plan has to get past the grant proposal phase first, let's start by reviewing some of Shirk's guidelines and expectations. Their webpage, Guidelines for Effective Knowledge Mobilization, provides some useful information and resources for the KMB planning phase. But for me, the most important information is contained in the case studies. Some of these are lengthy, so I've poured over them and I've pulled out three key insights that I think are really important to know before you start writing your KMB project plans. Insight number one, relationships with research users or knowledge users are key. So in your grant, you're going to need to be able to explain who the users of your research are going to be. So whether this is non-experts, practitioners, policymakers, what methods you're going to use to find out what their needs are and how you're going to connect and engage with them. Now, the challenge with defining who your research users are is being broad enough that you're able to show impact, but also specific enough to show that your plan is achievable. Insight number two, KMB is a career long endeavor, meaning that efforts should carry over from project to project. Being able to reference past KMB strategies and connect them to your current project is extremely beneficial. First, it increases the viability of your KMB efforts because you can build on the work that you've done in the past. So for example, the research users may stay the same for multiple projects. So it's helpful to be able to leverage relationships from past projects that you've already put work into establishing. 
The second point is that it adds to your credibility. It highlights your past successes in the area of knowledge mobilization, and it shows that you prioritize KMB. Insight number three. KMB should be embedded within the entire research project. Now we're going to talk about this concept of embedding KMB throughout this process or throughout this presentation. But to, to introduce this concept, many people see KMB as something to do at the end. They finish all the research, the data collection, they write the articles, and then they think about what they're going to do to get this out to the public or into the hands of their knowledge users. This is a really challenging way to approach knowledge mobilization because it's hard to get people's attention. It takes time to build relationships and to establish channels to actually connect with your audience. And to do this well, it requires thinking about knowledge mobilization from the very beginning of your project. So SHRP provides the destination where we all want to end up with our knowledge mobilization projects. But how exactly do we get there? For the rest of this presentation, I'm going to go through a five-step planning framework. This is an overview of all the steps involved, and it may seem simple and straightforward, but there's actually a lot of nuance in each step. And it takes discipline and patience to actually follow this process and not skip over things. Most people don't follow this process. Instead, they start with step number three. They decide what they're going to make, and then they work backwards. It's that menu approach that I talked about at the beginning. I want to encourage you to slow down and really invest in this full planning process, which means taking things one step at a time. The first step in planning any KMB project is figuring out who you need to reach and why you want to reach them. In other words, who's your audience and what's your purpose for communicating with them? Now, this may seem really obvious, but I think it's a lot more complicated than it seems at first. Most people, when they're called upon to define audience and purpose, do a very poor job of it. This is a scenario I encounter quite frequently. When I ask about audience, the response is all Canadians. When I ask why they want to reach that audience, the response is to raise awareness. Now, unfortunately, this just isn't specific enough. You may start with these kinds of broad strokes, but you really need to do the work to make this specific and narrow it down so that it can form the foundation of your KMB project in a meaningful and instructive way. So let's take a closer look at how to narrow down audience and purpose. We'll start with audience. And I like to use the term knowledge users instead because I find it's more action oriented and it helps me focus on who needs to know the results of the research and how they're actually going to use this research. So I like to categorize knowledge users into four groups. The first are experts and academics. This one is easy because you likely already know, understand, and are connected to this group. The second group is communities of practice. Now, I think of this as a professional category, so it may include practitioners from a particular field, for example, nurses or doctors. Communities of practice may also overlap in some ways with experts and academics. The next group are community members. So these are people from a specific group or community that don't have expert knowledge within a field, but are connected or impacted in some way by your area of research. The final group are representatives from institutions or government or other organizations who play some kind of role or influence policy development. Now, for your KMB project, you may be trying to reach users from multiple categories, and that is totally fine, but it's important to prioritize them. So within communication and marketing planning, we typically choose primary, secondary, and sometimes tertiary audiences. Choosing more than three audiences will seriously complicate your communication efforts. So let's take a look at what these audiences are. Primary. This is the main group you're focusing on. This is where you will direct most 
of your KMB project towards. So if you were to drop the secondary and tertiary audiences, your project would still be substantial enough to stand on its own. Secondary audiences. These are not as big a priority. So you may develop some KMB materials for this group, but they're not going to be your main focus. Tertiary audiences. This is a low priority group. You likely are not going to plan specific materials for these people, but they may be included because their interests overlap with your primary or your secondary audience. As you get further in the planning process, you might also want to be specific about which KMB products or outputs are going to be geared towards which knowledge users. So sometimes there's going to be overlap, but it's rare that you're going to be able to appeal to all three audiences with one single KMB deliverable. After you've defined your knowledge users, you're going to want to think about what role you want them to play in this project. Many people think of knowledge users as though they're audience members sitting in a theater, watching and listening intently to your research. But this is very rarely the case. Knowledge mobilization isn't about dissemination. It's about connection. It's hard to get people to care and to capture their attention, so you want to think about how to meaningfully engage with them. And this is best done by including them in the actual process of making KMB products or outputs. So when defining these roles, here's how I like to think about them. KMB collaborators, these are people that you're gonna actually have help you build and create your KMB outputs. KMB contributors play a less active role. So they're not actually creating KMB resources, but they're providing feedback and, and testing tools and resources or contributing pieces of information. The end user, this is the, this is the type of role that you want to avoid if you can. So this is where they are not involved at all in the KMB process or the development of any materials. They just receive those materials when the work is done. So this is a much more passive approach and it makes that research uptake a lot more difficult. But in certain situations, it can still be a valid way of working. It does depend on your context. Overall, ensuring that knowledge users play a more active role within your research and within the KMB process, it can really help you establish relationships and build networks and communication cha channels that will help you increase the reach and the impact of your research. Next, we're going to establish our purpose for engaging in knowledge mobilization itself. So this is where we need to figure out what we're hoping to achieve by disseminating this research and what do we want our audience to do with the research results. And for me, the second question is key. I often find that when developing purpose statements or mission statements or, or any kind of goal type, type document, it's so easy to be vague and flowery and abstract and hyperbolic. And I think it takes a lot of patience and focus to really keep your purpose grounded and instructive. Now, the reason that I grouped audience and purpose together and didn't separate them as two different steps is because I find that developing, defining your audience and developing your purpose statement, this is an iterative process. So you're likely going to move back and forth between defining each and, and tweak them um, so that they're in conversation with one another. So... Again, asking how users will use, how knowledge users use the research, what actions they'll take, what things they'll start, stop, continue, really defining it in concrete terms. This is going to make your knowledge mobilization plan more specific, more focused, and hopefully a lot more successful. So again, I want to return to this example. The most common purpose for engaging in knowledge mobilization that I hear is raise awareness. It's sort of this catch-all terms and 
it is not helpful when it comes to actually planning what you're going to do and how you're going to make it happen. And it could literally apply to any project. So you really want to make sure that your purpose, it could only apply to your project. It's that specific. So a better example for me is the 3419 homelessness campaign. And this was done by a group of graphic design students in the city of Baltimore. And they were tasked with developing a campaign that would educate students, middle school students, about homelessness. So what they came up with was this kit that they would deliver to a middle middle school class. And the kit had all of the tools to make a pillowcase poster. So the idea was to encourage the students to think about the concept of homelessness and what it would be like to go to sleep without your own bed. So the process was about sort of helping students think meaningfully about this. And they're also developing posters um, that they could distribute around the city. Now, you could say that this campaign centers around raising awareness, but and it does to a certain extent, but I actually think it's a lot more active because it's encouraging students to think meaningfully um, about what that lived experience of homelessness might be. And it's involving them a lot more actively in the process. They're not passive observers. They are they are KMB collaborators. They're knowledge mobilization collaborators. They're participating in that process and helping to spread the message and raise awareness. Um, but really, it's about the students. So if I was to take this project and work backwards and define the audience and the, the purpose, I would say the primary audience, the number one audience is middle middle school students at one Baltimore school. Now I emphasize the one school because this is how narrow a scope you can have. I think sometimes we bite off a lot more than we can chew and we expect that we can reach thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. And we really need to keep that scope achievable. So primary audience is the middle school students. The secondary audience are the citizens of Baltimore. So the most important piece is about the design of these posters, the workshops with students. The secondary piece is that these posters are going to live on the streets and people can can see them. Um, And then the tertiary audience are the parents of the the students. Um, So there's not anything actually designed for them. Um, But they're going to be aware of this because the students are working on this project. And so it might be good to think about them as you're building this, um, the, the toolkit. And then the purpose. So the purpose is to teach middle school students about homelessness and encourage them to think about what it means. The purpose is also to empower students so that they can mobilize the messaging about homelessness through the production and distribution of posters. And... The final thing is to promote action around homelessness within Baltimore citizens through effective communication materials. Starting with an audience and a purpose like this, suddenly you can really start to see how more meaningful knowledge mobilization products and projects can emerge. Now, as you can see, I really like tables and I really like categories. So in terms of breaking down your purpose and figuring out the why of the whole project, I find it useful to think about your purpose in three different categories. The first is disseminate. So this is about, again, raising awareness, educating, um, and contributing to a body of knowledge. So it's really, dissemination is a lot more um, about pushing the information. It's not so much about an exchange or a relationship. Promote action. So this is maybe influencing policy. Maybe you want to improve systems. Maybe you're looking to increase access. So it's all about doing something. Um, maybe it's encouraging other groups to do something. Maybe you're part of the action, but it's all about the doing. And then the third category is testing or learning. So maybe you want to learn more about 
um, access barriers, for example, or maybe you're looking to find knowledge gaps. Um, maybe you're, you're developing a pilot project and you're testing its usefulness. So the purpose of that knowledge mobilization is to get more information um, for about your, about your knowledge users. A couple of final notes about purpose before we move on to step two. So the first thing is that you might have a combination of all three different categories. So for example, you might want to contribute to a body of knowledge that's likely to be one of your purposes throughout most, if not all, of your research projects. And that might be one of the purposes of, of your knowledge mobilization efforts. Um, but you also might want to be doing other things um, that relate to action or learning about your knowledge users. Um, so you can have a combination. The next thing is that I would encourage you to keep things action oriented. Use those verbs so that it keeps that purpose active and planning, that you're not just putting stuff out there and hoping that someone's going to find it, use it, understand it, that you're actually thinking about how you're going to put it into action, research into action. And then the final thing I wanted to say is that when defining both your audience and your purpose, I think it's really important to include information related to your career and your professional goals. Now, this is not necessarily something that you're going to include in a grant application or in, you know, official project documents. But I would encourage you to write down what you really want to see professionally come out of this research project. And the reason I say that um, is that it's very easy for your own personal and professional goals to influence what you think the knowledge user needs or wants. And I think it's totally okay if one of your goals is, I want to impress my colleagues. I want to gain professional accolades. I want to make the funder happy. I want to increase my chances for future funding. That's, this is totally fine. Write it down. Because it will help you separate the things that you want from the things that your audience or your knowledge users need. So for example, you might want to produce a flashy, innovative website. Um, because you really think it's going to gain professional attention and you really want that attention. But in fact, your project is such that your audience, what they really need is a good old fashioned book. So you might, if you don't have the awareness of what's your personal professional goal versus what the audience needs, if you don't have that awareness, you might work really hard to convince um, yourself and the funder that the website for example, is actually what the user needs. Um, so yeah, just for yourself, write down some of those professional things, what you're hoping to gain personally, professionally from this within your career. The next step in the planning process is to start thinking about how you're going to incorporate knowledge mobilization within your research activities. So at what stage are you going to start planning start working on knowledge mobilization outputs, what activities are going to occur at the different stages. And in general, there are two choices as to how to, how, how to do that. The first is embedded. So you can put KMB activities and outputs, you can work on them throughout the entire research process and really incorporate knowledge mobilization as a meaningful part of the entire research. The second option is end of stage. So this is research and knowledge mobilization are separate. Research is first. After you're done all of that, uh, all of the research process, then at the end you figure out how, um, how you're going to get that knowledge out there. As I've mentioned earlier, most people, most projects fall into the second category, their end of stage. And at CCK, we really try to encourage people to consider the embedded approach. It's more difficult. It takes a lot more work and a lot more planning, foresight, um, but it has a lot of benefits. The first thing is that starting early allows you to build a relationship with your audience or your knowledge users. So I have mentioned that it is so difficult 
to get people's attention. And I think that many people really underestimate the work that's required to engage meaningfully with your target audience. I, I think that there's this sense that we can just launch a website and send out a few tweets and hopefully people are going to naturally flock to this content. And unfortunately, it just isn't the case. And day after day, um, media environments, they just get more and more full. So it's, it's hard to get people's attention. So starting early means that you can really establish a connection and work to build those networks and relationships. The second reason is that if you start early, you're going to actually allocate more time and effort um, to establishing that connection and to working on those knowledge mobilization pieces. The third reason is that if you engage early with your audience, you can actually test your products. You can develop prototypes. You can get feedback. Um, and that means that those the end product is going to be better and a lot more effective. And the final reason is that by connecting with your knowledge users and considering them throughout that research project, it can actually feed the research itself. Um, so you can find more opportunities to combine um, and blur the lines between what is research and what is knowledge mobilization. And that can be a really, really powerful thing. Step number three is to determine the KMB outputs. And as I mentioned earlier, most people start with this step. They start with trying to figure out what the product, the deliverable, the output is going to be. And then they work backwards and define audience and purpose. And I think that this is a flawed approach because once you've outlined your purpose for developing your KMB outputs, and once you've identified the knowledge users who are going to engage with those outputs, that's going to really feed the, your brainstorming process and you're going to be able to develop more effective mediums and methods that are actually going to suit your project. So let's just take a look at some of the possibilities in terms of these products or outputs. So Shirk provides this comprehensive list, books, journal articles, dance, videos, pamphlets. And as you can see, there's a lot of options. Some are traditional. Um, some have emerged just within the past decade. But for me, what this list doesn't show is this growing pressure that I've been sensing within the academy to explore new and innovative mediums and methods. Now, I am all for pushing the boundaries and thinking outside the box. And I, I think that's really important. But I also worry that the pressure to constantly innovate can cause a couple of issues. The first is I see it pushing people to repackage and rebrand traditional materials as something that's innovative and new. So I've seen grant proposals that have come up with all kinds of fancy terminology and names to replace what is essentially a blog. So that's the first issue I have with it. The second is that when you focus on innovative mediums, you often ignore the value and importance of less traditional or less flashy forms of knowledge mobilization. They're sometimes they're the most effective way to get the research into the hands of knowledge users is this traditional approach. And you can't ignore something that's going to be the best option, the most effective thing, just because it maybe it's not as as new or flashy. So those are two two important points to make. Um, I think another big thing for me is that when we focus on flashy mediums, and when we overemphasize the importance of that medium itself in general, the quality of the work suffers. So if we're too focused on the technology, the platforms, the mediums. We can lose focus on what makes strong research communication. So an example for you. A, a few years ago, I went to see a 4DX movie, which is a multi-sensory experience. So you're in a chair. It's a 3D movie. You've got the glasses on. Um, but at certain points during the movie, there's scent released into the theater. Sometimes you're misted with water when there's an actual rainstorm on screen. The chairs are moving around. 
and I thought the whole experience was awful. I absolutely hated it. Um, now, the sensory experience is designed to be more immersive, but for me, it had the opposite effect. It was jarring, it was weird and confusing, um, and, and to top it all off, the movie was really bad. Now, by all accounts, this way of presenting a movie is innovative. And on paper, you could likely convince many people that this was going to provide a groundbreaking movie experience. But in reality, the good old fashioned way we've been watching movies since their inception, to me, this method far outweighs the more innovative approach. And some people may disagree with me, but me as an audience member prefers the old fashioned approach. It's not sexy, but it works. So for me, this section, while it's all about choosing that medium, that output, what I'm going to suggest is that what's more important than defining what your medium is, is determining what quality looks like. And I think those two things need to be done in tandem. So as you decide, okay, I'm going to do a website, you need to at the same time figure out what does quality look like within this context, within the context of my audience, my knowledge users, the purpose of this project, how am I going to know when this website is good? So some of the questions that you might ask, some of the quality criteria that you might use when you're planning or evaluating the KMB outputs. Um, is the story or message memorable or entertaining? Are the ideas clear and easy to understand? Is this a tool or a resource that's easy to access? Are the KMB outputs useful? For me, this is a really, really important criteria and one that I ask myself constantly when I'm making anything. Is it useful? I think you can't go wrong if it's useful. So for me, for most projects that I work on, my quality criteria really centers around messaging. And I think that for that KMB materials projects, regardless of what medium, they all depend on excellent messaging. And a framework that I depend on for that comes from a book called Made to Stick, Why Some Ideas Survive and Others Die. And this is by Chip and Dan Heath. Chip Heath is a professor, professor of organizational behavior at Stanford. And Dan Heath is a fellow at the Center for Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship at Duke University. So both academics, and they've written this book about what makes ideas memorable and interesting and what makes people you know, really latch on to an idea. So they outline in this book, six principles for sticky ideas. And I, I love this again. I love tables. And this to me is so such a valuable way of thinking about your core messaging or the core things that you're going to communicate within any type of knowledge mobilization output or product. So the first principle is simplicity. And I don't care whether you're an expert or a lay person, everyone loves simplicity and brevity. So to have really strong um, KMB outputs, you need to strip things down to the information, to only the information that's absolutely necessary. Now, this is not about um, taking away important details, making things unnecessarily short. And the authors use a really great analogy, which is you're looking to create a proverb, not a soundbite. And I just love that example. A proverb, not a soundbite. So a proverb contains so much information within it. Um, and the example that they, that they use in the book is the proverb, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And I would challenge you to find a shorter and a more memorable way to explain that message that's that's contained within that proverb. Um, the second principle is unexpectedness. So shocking and surprising people. When you surprise people, they are alert and focused. They are ready to listen. The third one is concreteness. 
this is a really big one for me. And I think it's especially important within academia when we're working with highly abstract concepts. Um, you need to find ways to ground the abstract into the concrete. And you do this by finding images, planting images in people's brains, finding actions and sensory information, looking for metaphors, analogies, any way you can to develop something concrete and that, that someone can, you know, imagine holding in their hand. The, the fourth idea or the fourth principle is credibility. And this is, they've got a little twist on this. It's an interesting one for me. Um, and I think an important one, especially with the proliferation of fake news and conspiracy theory theories, um, this is about helping people test the idea for themselves. So not relying on the fact that, well, this is academic research, so it should have, it should naturally be credible to people. This is about developing things that people can kind of move around in their mind and kind of come to discoveries on their own. But those discoveries are the things that you're hoping that they're going to find. So the example in the book that they use is um, Ronald Reagan in the 1980 presidential debate where he's looking to unseat the current president, Jimmy Carter. Instead of quoting statistics about how bad the economy was, he simply said, ask yourself if you're better off than you were four years ago. You're better off today than you were four years ago. So instead of overwhelming the audience with facts and statistics, which feel like they're going to be compelling, but they actually don't really grab people. So you want to look for ways that you can, you can, that people can test these ideas for themselves. The fifth principle is emotions. So this one is pretty straightforward, but I think actually really difficult to implement. So you want to try to make people feel something. I think the first step is identifying what exactly you want to make them feel. I, that can be a really tricky piece. Um, and this might be about testing, um, testing out different strategies. For me, it's about finding that hook. So the message that is relevant and interesting and, and connects with people on a gut level. The sixth principle is stories, telling stories. Again, a straightforward concept, very difficult to enact. But if you can start to think right from the beginning, how do I take the research findings? How do I take the ideas and the messages from my research and turn that into a narrative? They're going to be so much more likely to be remembered and to be interesting to people. A tool that I rely on heavily is finding the metaphors and the analogies. And these things often really help you transform information into plot points. So this is just a brief introduction into, um, into Made to Stick and the ideas within this book, but I found it really, really helpful and a helpful way to start planning what are the messages that are going to be contained within the outputs, within the knowledge mobilization pieces that you're developing and defining those messages. That's, those messages are gonna carry over no matter what medium you're choosing. One of Shirk's uh, pieces of advice is to figure out how KMB projects are going to feed your overall research goals. And specifically, they ask, will interactions with knowledge users be fed into research design? And I think this is tricky to figure out, and likely it's an iterative process that involves developing K KMB ideas alongside your research methodologies. Um, but I think there are some things that you can consider as you start to map KMB to your research goals. So you might want to consider how, how are knowledge users or how can knowledge users be incorporated in data collection? So can they be um, part of a co-production of knowledge? Um, I think it's important to think about how your interactions with knowledge users are going to inform those KMB outputs. For example, are you going to conduct uh, focus groups with your knowledge users? Are you going to develop um, preliminary prototypes and then test them with knowledge users? 
You can also think about how KMB outputs can actually be used in the data collection process. So for example, at CCK, we created a website for a prof who was conducting accounting research. And we actually worked with him to think about ways that the research that was designed to communicate, or sorry, the website that was designed to communicate his research, what role that could play in, in facilitating further uh, data collection. The final thing that you might want to consider is, is how, how might your KMB outputs feed future projects? So this is going back to when we discussed the idea of KMB being a, an ongoing um, lifelong process, something that carries over from project to project. So it's just a helpful thing to think about how can the KMB outputs feed future projects and, and how can KMB projects or activities from past projects feed this current one. The final step within the planning framework is to figure out who is going to do all of the KMB work. Now, I think there's, there's very little discussion within the academic community about how KMB work actually gets done. So it's assumed that that work is supposed to be done by the research team themselves. And more often than not, this is the case. But it doesn't have to be this way. And to me, it's wildly unreasonable to expect academics, researchers to be experts in their field, skilled at research, great teachers, and also to be able to build websites and develop social media strategies. And that is why I'm so intent on talking about the skills of designers and communication specialists as they relate to communicating research, because I think that people with these skills fill a very important gap. Enter the knowledge broker. So this is a term that I, I was introduced to in Monica Batak's MRP, which I mentioned earlier. And I would encourage anyone interested in learning more about knowledge mobilization to access her paper. It is, it's excellent. Um, anyway, Batak explains that as the professional pr practice of knowledge mobilization has evolved, this role has emerged. And knowledge brokers are intermediators, intermediaries between researchers and people that consume research. So what exactly does a knowledge broker's role involve? Well, it varies depending on the project, depending on the institution. Um, it could mean advising academics and helping them plan KMB activities. It could be writing plain language summaries. It could be about connecting with policymakers. It could involve website design, graphic design. And at CCK, I would consider us knowledge brokers. So our role involves two things. We strategize around effective knowledge mobilization approaches and we, we come up with plans. And we also design and develop the actual K and B assets or the products or the outputs the, the materials themselves. So it's strategy and it's also creative design. I think an important point to mention here is that this role of the knowledge broker, it's an emerging role. And you're not going to find necessarily people at the university with this job title. It's not like there's a bunch of knowledge brokers just running around, um, you know, waiting to, to communicate knowledge. And in fact, CCK as a center, we're actually quite unique and I haven't found many, many similar centers at other universities. Instead, what you'll find is people both inside the university and outside the university with experience communicating research or highly technical information or um, highly complex information. These people might be designers, marketers, communication specialists, um, but what's important is that it's unlikely that they will see themselves as knowledge brokers, have that terminology, or understand that what they're doing is knowledge mobilization. And so this is a really important point because sometimes you might have to do some digging around to be able to find people with the skills who can do this work well. 
because they may not know that they could do this work well. And it's also, I think, important because it, to, cons- to expand the types of roles that you think are necessary within your research project. So you may be focusing on, on building your research capacity and hiring and, and collaborating with people that can focus on research. I think it's really important to think about who can actually help us create knowledge mobilization products and outputs. I've found that most teams, they consist of researchers and students, and it's usually grad students that are recruited to do the knowledge mobilization work. So oftentimes this is simply because they're younger. So they're seen as understanding technology and social media. And so they seem like perfect candidates to help with this knowledge mobilization piece. And it's sort of this, again, it's part of the kind of last ditch effort to get these things done. We'll, we'll get a grad student to do it. And in terms of their formal qualification, they're hired because of their research interests. They're not hired because of their ability to communicate their ability to develop these knowledge mobilization pieces. So I think that there is a real benefit in creating this knowledge broker role, thinking of this role as an important part of your research team, and then hiring accordingly, looking for someone with the skills, not necessarily in conducting research, the skills in taking that research, making it accessible and relevant and engaging and memorable. So why are you going to hire knowledge brokers? Well, they have skills in communicating complex information. So as I've mentioned, grad students are a big part of a lot of research projects. They are often the main people who are actually engaging in developing these KMB strategies and products. And they may be very skilled in this area, but they may not have the skill sets or experience necessary to do it well. Um, So it may be great to consider other types of people, a communications consultant, a freelance writer or editor, or even a student who is in the field of communications or marketing or design. Um, The second reason, the second important part about this knowledge broker role is that it brings in an outside perspective. So using the research team to create the knowledge mobilization materials, it means that they're going to have some blind spots. They're familiar with the information. They're experts on it. And so they may not see the things that are complex, that are difficult. Um, They also may not fully understand what's the hook. What's the, the most interesting, relevant, important piece of this research? It may all feel important um, because you're so close to it. So bringing in a knowledge broker can have that outside experience because they're likely not going to be experts in your field. So for me, I'm a graphic designer um, and a web designer. I come into a research project completely open to new information. I don't know anything about this person's research. And so I have to come in as a layperson and figure it out for myself. And so that allows me this outsider perspective um, I, I can grasp on to what I think is really interesting, to what I think will, will sort of sell, for lack of a better term. And I can spot right away what's going to be difficult to communicate, what people are going to have trouble understanding. The third thing, the third value of that knowledge broker is technical expertise. So we're really lucky in FCAD because so many FCAD students have a wide range of skills. And I think we've gotten spoiled. And so we've gotten used to really relying on students to do this work um, because they have such a a wide variety of design, communication, and production skills. When I work with other faculties, they have a harder time. So I have been working with a team from the School of Nursing, and they are just blown away by the things that the students who work for CCK are capable of. And They've now started to consider this communications design marketing role in future research projects because they see that, oh, this is is the skill set we've been missing. So I think 
the bottom line is actively recruiting people with these skills, not hoping that they're going to be, that you're going to find someone skilled in research who may have a hobby in these areas, but looking for people who've devoted their their careers and their lives to this, this skill set um, and this craft. So how do you actually find knowledge brokers? Um, because as I said earlier, it's, it's not this, um, it's not, you're not going to find a list of knowledge brokers on the Ryerson website. Um, and also you're not, you're, a lot of the people working in these fields may not know that this is what they're actually doing. So what I would suggest is looking for people with skills in marketing and communication. So if they have experience in these areas, they're going to be very skilled and understand this process of communicating complex information. People who have done digital content strategy, this is about figuring out how to create meaningful website content and meaningful web um, experiences and telling great stories. Um, People with social media experience, people who can write, but write in ways that is um, more accessible. Um, people with graphic design or web design skills, people who have videography or motion graphic design. These are just kind of a brief list. Um, but if you find people with these skills, it's going to really make your life a lot easier when it comes to developing these knowledge mobilization pieces. And my personal, if you're looking, if you could, if I could identify the most valuable skill for me, it's graphic design, higher graphic designers. Now, granted, I am a graphic designer, so I am biased, but for me, this is one of the most, uh, this is the skill, a skill that's in constant demand at CCK. I, I cannot identify a project we've worked on that didn't involve about 60% graphic design. Um, and I think what makes graphic designers so valuable in this is that At our core, we are communicators. We are constantly thinking about how to get messages across clearly and beautifully. So that's just my my biased advice. So overall, um, what I'm trying to to communicate with this step and, and why I think it's so important is that this concept of the knowledge broker role really expands your idea of who to include on your research team. Thinking a little bit more broadly beyond just this research focus and thinking about what are the skill sets that I need to be able to not just do really sound and important research, but get that research out there into the hands of the people that need it. And if researchers can create more of these opportunities within research teams for people with the skills in communicating research, this field will grow and hopefully become more formalized. And eventually what I hope is that universities will start to provide more support for academics in this this area. So that in a 45 minute nutshell is the planning process that we use at CCK to build knowledge mobilization strategies that are impactful. Now to help you remember that information, I've created a handy little infographic that's available for download on the CCK website. It includes some key pieces of advice for each of those planning phases, a summary of the information that I went through in this presentation, and some brainstorming questions to help you get started in your planning process. Just a reminder again about our live Q&A event on February 4th at 1 p.m. Please come and bring your questions or any thoughts or ideas around knowledge mobilization that you'd like to discuss. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you on February 4th.